Good afternoon, folks, and welcome back to another episode of Redeeming the Time. I'm your host, Chris Macy, and I'm so glad you could be here with us this afternoon. I know Christmas is just around the corner, and I don't know, maybe you got some uh, family in town. I hope you're all gathered together with your eggnog, listening to the, the lesson we have for us today. And I'm joined in studio today by a very special guest. I'm here with my dad, Jim Macy. How you doing, Dad? Doing great, son. Doing great. And I'm very happy to be here with you to um, share this joyous occasion. Yeah, I appreciate it. And, uh, looking forward to the, the topic we have on hand. We're going to be talking about uh, the pattern. And before we get into the Bible and, and uh, what God's Word has to say about that, I, I, I see a, a really an unfortunate but a really good example of what happens when you don't follow uh, the pattern, a, a pattern that is set forth, that is intended for a particular goal. We know for Christians, the in, in, uh, God intends for us to be more like his son, Christ, and so he set forth this pattern there. But in our government today here in the United States, now I love our country. I, I, I pray for it and for our leaders. But we can see, not just in the federal level, but even in state levels and other places, elected officials are beginning to pick and choose what laws they want to choose. It doesn't matter if the law is on the book or not. They don't believe they have to enforce it if they don't want to. And so they begin to pick and choose what they want to enforce, how and when. And as a result, we're seeing society really breaking down, especially over these last few weeks uh, with the things going on in Ferguson and in Florida and New York, the, the assassination of the cop. I see that all pointing back to a lack of authority and a lack of uh, holding true to a pattern that was set for us by our founding fathers. What, what are your thoughts on that, Dad? Well, I certainly agree. Um, the evidence uh, is quite evident that uh, what's happened the past few weeks is just a breakdown of uh, respect for government, respect for law and uh, authority, and I don't know where we're headed, but it doesn't look good. Uh, I see people maybe taking the opportunity to justify strengthening government to where they have more control uh, and justifying it by saying, well, we have to do this in order to bring about civil obedience. And it's quite frightening. Well. Uh, yeah, and good point, and I, I don't know either where it's going to go. Nobody can know or predict the future. M my thoughts on it, though, is like I, I look at it like this. Usually in times like this, when we look, we look around and we wonder, man, where is our leadership? Where are those people who are going to stand up and, and, and take a stand uh, against these sort of things? It typically happens at these vital points. Uh, look at the church back in the 1800s during the, the, the restoration uh, period. Uh, I believe men like Alexander Campbell and Thomas Campbell, Barton W. Stone, uh, even though they were all doing this separately and, and, and not in conjunction with one another, they, they looked around and they saw what was happening in religion. They were seeing that they were, these people are, are leaving the true pattern that God had set forth uh, uh, for them, and they thought, well, this isn't what we want want. And so they began to look at just the Bible. They want to be New Testament Christians only. And so they began to step up. And, of course, now, uh, the, the, or back then, the, the church began to grow and it was getting strong. But that began to fade off. And I'm, I'm looking around in the world today and in, at religion, and, and I'm wondering, man, what, what is going on? We have lost our focus. We lost the, the whole point of the restoration. We should always have that in our heart of restoring ourselves to be just New Testament Christians. And so I'm hopeful that in this time, men, uh, uh, sound men of the word, will set, look around and say, man, what, we need to step up and have another restoration and step up and begin to go back to the Bible. Do you see that? I mean, I guess, I guess what I'm saying is I see us moving toward another dark age where the, the, the church is almost non-existent well it certainly uh, appears that way uh, I see a number of uh, warnings that if we don't change if we don't turn back to the biblical truth that we are doomed to head in that dark age area 
I'm, I'm hoping that, of course, let the Lord's will be done. Uh, as we have seen and noted a number of times in the Old Testament, the Lord allowed his people to go into darkness in order to get their attention. It's a shame that people have to suffer such things, but... Sometimes we have to have that wake-up call. Right, that is that would be a wake-up call, and it's a shame that people would have to suffer such um, behavior, but it's headed in that direction unless, like you said, we have this revival and wake-up call and start turning back to the Word and practicing truth and not try to justify such ugly behavior. Yeah, and, and that's true. And so I, I opened up the program talking about how government sometimes, or not sometimes, but does, pick and choose what laws it wants to, to enforce. And as a result, we're seeing the result. It, it's the breakdown of society. Things are not moving uh, smoothly. We, we can tell that everything is on thin ice. But we see that same thing happening in religion, where people are now looking at the, the, the Bible as a guide, more of just a simple guide rather than the pattern to follow. So they look through it and they think, well, you know, uh, uh, we know it says here that the men should be preachers, but, you know, we live in a different age now. And so let's let women preach or women be our elders as well. Well, we know what Paul says in Romans chapter 1 about homosexuality, but we, we want more people. We want to we show the world how tolerant we are. So let's let the the uh, uh, homosexuals come in. Well, we, we know what what the Lord thinks about the sanctity of life, and but so many people have unplanned pregnancies, and let's just say it's okay to have abortions and, and be okay with that. And we see people picking and choosing, and as a result, you look out there, and where is the pattern? And they think it's okay, and they think what they're doing isn't against God's will. But then. I read passages like in John chapter 2, and uh, for our folks out there uh, uh, in the show, I'm going to read from the New American Standard Bible, John chapter 2, verses 13 to 16. Here it says, or the writer writes, The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple and uh, with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. And I see here an example for us about the pattern. Th three things. First, Jesus confronted a deviation from the divine standard that was set forth by his father. He looked out there. He saw the temple. The temple of God is a place where the Jews were to worship God in a certain way. And they weren't doing that anymore. They had deviated from that and began to do things the way they wanted in a more worldly fashion. Second, uh, he opposed those who changed the divine standard. We see that in, in multiple ways. He had that scourge of cords. He overturned the tables. And then he proclaimed the truth that they had violated. Well, that was right there at the very last. Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. I mean, this is a glaring example for everyone out there what God thinks about man changing the standard or the pattern that he has set forth. Would you agree with that? Man? Oh, yes, absolutely. No doubt. That's correct. There's many passages that we could go to. I mean, even the Apostle Paul on his missionary journey and in his writings to the churches tried to warn, if I may read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And that, that's, a, that's a good point. Same mind and the same judgment. It actually uh, works, flows well to, to another point I want to bring up. Um, one of the, because uh, when, when, when I look at verses like that, look at John chapter 2, I mean, it tells me, or at least I see, God's mind and his heart toward these things. 
Oh yes. And I don't want to be working against God. That's that's fearful to me. I mean, He's God. Yes. And you would, I would think anyone who is striving to be a, a, a Christian or trying to do the will of God, passages like this would be standing out to me, and it would scare me to deviate from the pattern. So why why aren't people scared about it? Why aren't they nervous about changing things God has set forth? I think one of the mindsets mindset that we confront in our present generation is a belief that there is no such thing as absolute truth. And that just means that uh, people believe there is no universal standard of right or wrong. And when you find this kind of thinking among religious folks, even though they may believe in God and that salvation is in Christ, they do not believe there is a divine pattern for all of Christianity. Their modernistic view that there is no absolute truth has led them, I think, to this conclusion that God has left the development of Christianity to each generation. And so one's approach to Christianity in the 21st century uh, might look different than the approach in the New Testament uh, 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 generation in every century in between. And even within the same century, there may be allowable variations in the way we attempt to exhibit Christianity to the world around us. The join the church of your choice mentality is basically derived from that idea that there is no absolute truth. <clears throat> and, and so the modern world and current religions don't believe that God has set up a pattern to follow in our approach to being Christians. Christianity has become uh, very diverse in the modern era uh, to the extent that practically anything goes in the name of Christ. They'll say whatever they want and then just tack on in the name of Christ and they think that makes it okay. Scholars and clerics believe that there are only a few general teachings of Scripture that apply to all, and the details are left up to us to work out in our own way. In other words, there's no divine pattern required for everyone to follow, and this kind of thinking has led some to throw out specific beliefs and practices that have for years identified true believers. Beliefs about <clears throat> matters such as baptism, the non-use of instrumental music and in worship, the role of women in worship have been downgraded to matters of culture and tradition. And we were told that these beliefs certainly do not fall in into a pattern for all Christians to follow. That's the general teaching in the world. So looking through the Bible, uh, passages like John chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I mean, these things are obviously in a, a, a direct conflict with the idea there's no absolute truth. I'm not trying to take a, 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 a away anything, but get any, any thoughts you have on that, Dad? Uh, anything you want to add? Well, to again, that? I'm just turning to the Word and seeing the teaching of Jesus. And of course, what comes to mind is Matthew chapter 15, beginning verse 8. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So what that's telling me is that even today, some people will justify their belief, their behavior, on teaching of men instead of turning to God's Word, searching the Scripture, and following that teaching from the Word. And here we find ourselves having these various teachings and even accepting ungodly evil, whether it be the homosexual behavior or the termination of life, justifying it because some men have justified it and said, well, this is okay, this is acceptable behavior, and we're following men and not the Word of God. Exactly. I mean, it goes, uh, a pattern is, is uh, uh, essential if you want to build what a designer wants built. So you've got to have something to follow. Uh, and now, if you follow the doctrines of men, you're going to build what the world wants built. But if you follow the pattern from the designer of God, then you're going to build what God wants built. If you, if you take a little bit of men's and a little bit of God's and put them together, guess what? You're building what the world wants, not what God wants. And people think they can do that. They try to put one foot in the world and one foot 
uh, uh, in, in, into God, and it doesn't work. You can't divide yourself that way. You either love the one and hate the other or vice versa. Pattern or blueprint represents everything that the owner or designer has in mind. Let the, the illustration of building a house. Um, if you have a specific way you want your house built, you draw up the plans and you, you have everything you want just the way you want it, all the walls, the doors, each room, and you hand it over to somebody, you pay them money, say, this is what I want, what do you expect? Do you expect them, if you have a two-story home with uh, all the bedrooms upstairs and the living quarters downstairs, what if you go in that new house they built and they, they had it decided, you know, let's put all the kitchen in and everything, let's put that on the second floor, We'll put all the bedrooms downstairs. Would you be okay with that? That would be a problem. Yes. Why? Well, why? I mean, it's it's just it, they just took your pattern. They thought, you know, <clears throat> this is good, but I like it this way, and so they build it another way, and then they give it to you. Like, here you go. Well, that'd be great. I'd invite <laughs> someone into my bedroom when I open the front door. That would be somewhat <laughs> awkward. Yeah, it's because you're they're not following the blueprint, the design. God has given us a blueprint. Genesis chapter 6, verses 13 to 22. God gave Noah a specific pattern on how to build the ark. We know it was to be made out of gopher wood. It was going to be uh, 300 cubits in length, 50 wide, 30 tall. It was going to have consist of three decks. A window was going to be put in a, a cubit from the top, and a door was going to be placed on the side. Hebrews 8, 5, the author there quotes what God said to Moses in Exodus chapter 25. And the, he uses that word pattern to describe how Moses was to build the tabernacle that God designed. And in Exodus chapter 25, 26, and 27, God goes into great detail all the way down to even the utensils used in the tabernacle. Why would he go into so much detail? Because he had a specific way he wanted it to be done. And you can read through those chapters and know exactly what God wants. We could recreate the whole tabernacle because we have the whole pattern in like manner. God gave patterns for worship to the in the Old Testament for when in the uh, back with Cain and Abel. Abel by faith uh, followed the directions of God. Cain did not. Over and over again, we find examples uh, of pattern throughout the Old Testament, and it's essential if you want to reproduce what the designer once built. If a designer or owner wants his design to uh, be reproduced in a more in more than one place, then a pattern or a blueprint is, is essential. Uh, again, that building the house uh, illustration, building ships, building cars. I mean, if you bought a 2010 uh, Toyota Corolla and it gets damaged or crashed, and then you go and get another 2010 Corolla, you're going to expect it to be the exact same as the one you had. God intended... Christianity to continue beyond the first century. The beginning occurred in Acts 2. God never intended it uh, to last only for one generation. His purpose was eternal in nature to all generations. And he intended Christianity to continue throughout all of them. Uh, and so he had to, there had to be a way to, that it could be reproduced in every generation after Christ and after the apostles. Uh, after Christ had ascended, the apostles died off. How was it going to continue forth? How was he going to ensure that the, uh, the intended uh, 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 product was going to be reproduced in every generation. God's word, the Bible, is our pattern. And it's essential to measure the correctness of the structure being built using a pattern. Without it, uh, you could not determine uh, what, would, what, what to build. It fulfills what the owner has in mind to design. The contractor didn't follow uh, the blueprint in construction of a house or building, then the owner ha uh, has a written stand, or uh, uh, the owner would have dispute with them, like you're saying. You don't want to open up your front door into your bedroom for folks. You got a, a pattern already in mind. Uh, I remember uh, when, when I went to go, uh, when I was in the Army back in Hawaii, we were helping restore the USS Missouri, the, the, uh, the uh, naval ship that where they signed the, the peace treaty or the, the ending of the war, World War II, for the, from the Japanese. Yes. And when we got there, we had uh, all these things they wanted us to do of, of rebuilding certain places where the wood had uh, rotted and whatnot. And when, before we got started, we were up on the decks, and they had this big table, and they laid out blueprints of the ship. 
And then in, in that, they had all these areas. They said, okay, there's a wall completely missing down lower decks. We want to rebuild it there. Here's where it's at. This is what it was made with. Let's get those materials and redo that so it looks like it did before. Why would they pull out the blueprints? Because they wanted it to be the intended product from before. It had lost that because of damage and destruction and, and, and rust and whatnot. And so they had to uh, move toward these things. And so a pattern makes the structure unique and distinctive. Once they got everything together, you could see a picture of the USS Missouri and know that's the USS Missouri. It's unique. It's distinctive. Uh, if you're driving down, you drove out here from uh, Missouri. It's a long drive, and after a while, you get hungry. You imagine you're driving down uh, the interstate, and all of a sudden you see, you don't see the words, but you can see golden arches. What would be the first thing that came to your mind, Dad? McDonald's. It's up ahead. McDonald's. Why? Something distinctive. Right. You know Better. what the, everybody knows what that is. And if you owned a McDonald's and you wanted a, uh, uh, you decide, you know what, I'm not going to put the golden arches up there. They take your franchise away. People wouldn't recognize it for what it is because that those golden arches makes it distinctive, makes it very clear and obvious what it is. God intended Christianity to be unique or distinctive from the religions of men. So Jesus asks this great question in Matthew 21, verse 25, concerning the baptism of John. Is it from heaven or is it from men? Why would he ask that question, Dad? He was making the point that the true teaching comes from God only and not from men. That's right. There's a difference. Yes. Very big. There's a pattern that you can find from the world, and there's a pattern that you can know from God. And so he asked that, that question. He was referring to the authority, I, I think, behind uh, John's teaching. And he's talking about the source of it. You certainly could not find this practice among current religions. It was like the golden arches in McDonald's. It, it distinguished the new teaching that God was giving through John from the religions of men that had developed through the years. God had always opposed man's approach to religion and expects men to follow his. This was true in the beginning with Cain and Abel, continues to be God's desire throughout all generations since, and Jesus proclaimed that one offers up vain worship, as you were pointing out earlier, vain worship when he teaches the doctrines of men. Back to Matthew chapter 15, verse 9. Yes. The doctrines of men are not, a, or, or the doctrines of men are a deviation from a pattern that was set forth by God. Twelve men in Acts chapter 19 were re-baptized by Paul. Remember when he approached them and asked them, have you received the Holy Spirit? Said, oh, we don't even know if we've heard, uh, we've never even heard of such a thing. Until what were you baptized? We were baptized into John's baptism. But that came to an end on the day of Pentecost with the uh, implementation of the, the church. That was no longer valid. Now they must be baptized into Christ. <gasps> there is a pattern. There was something that God intended for them to do. The Bible, for all our folks out there, the Bible reveals that God did provide a pattern for us to build Christianity in any generation and in any place on the face of the earth. Paul spoke in Romans chapter 6, verse 17 of that form of teaching to which you were committed. That word form is pattern theology. Um, Jude writes that we should contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered to the saints, verse 3. And then Paul consistently gives the same directions in all the churches. In 1 Corinthians 7, 14, 16, he's all throughout 1 Corinthians, he makes that very clear. All of this says that God has given just one pattern for all of us to follow. I don't think we should be ever we should ever be intimidated by the modern efforts to amend or neglect the pattern. Rather, we should be encouraged to discover and follow the pattern God has given to us. In fact, Dad, you were making a, a, a very good a point of that uh, right before we started the program. You were talking about how you were worried how folks uh, in in, in, in the uh, uh, Christianity today seem to be neglecting the second greatest commandment. You were talking about uh, abortion. You, you want me uh, go, go ahead and share with our listeners a little bit about what you were saying. Well, I'm just concerned even amongst the, the Lord's church, the people's attitude, Christians' attitude about um, ignoring or 
not being concerned about some Christians um, not uh, helping out their neighbor, and I mean the most, in, uh, the most innocent neighbor, and that's the unborn child. And I'm quite concerned about that. We need to be more mindful of that. Yeah, and, and we are to love our neighbor, okay. and those children have, they have no one to help them. God has always intended us to be there for them, and we got to do whatever we can as far as our uh, freedom is within Christ to do to try to help these children out. And I believe through voting, uh, through uh, getting information out there, helping people realize what what's going on and happening in these situations, uh, breaks my heart whenever I think about all those poor children and the. the uh, they, they don't get a chance at life because of the way the world is going. But we can't change things by sit, simply sitting here and, and just talking about it on the radio. Things change by changing the hearts and minds of the people. And I believe most people want to know the truth. And when they see it or when they hear it, they'll latch on to it. Now, obviously, many will, will get aggravated and they will try to suppress the truth or they'll try to shut us down. But many uh, others will, will be excited to know what the truth is. And I think when it is explained to them in a whole full way, the full pattern shown, and we just let the Bible speak in ourselves, it is the power of God unto salvation for to all believers, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And I believe that that's where we need to give it to. Well, and I'm so thankful for God's word. But we're going to have to wrap it up. We're actually out of time. Dad, I appreciate you being here with us. I thank all of our listeners out there. Uh, we're going to be posting this online. Feel free to go to www.nvcoc.net to catch any of the past programs you missed. But above all, we want to thank our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for redeeming, giving us this opportunity to redeem 